Tow, the great detectives of old-time radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Grant. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. A reminder that our uh, ebook sale is still going on through the end of the month. Just go over to booksale.greatdetectives.net. We're taking part in the author's give back sale. And uh, on each specific product page for any book you're interested in, whether it's my novel Slime Incorporated or it's some of my superhero comedy novels or uh, All I Needed to Know I Learned from Columbo or All I Needed to Know I Learned from Dragnet, whichever uh, item you're interested in, you just take the code on the page and at checkout to get the discount. You can also uh, get... Uh, Three items for free. My first two novels, Tales of the Dim Night and Fly Another Day. And also, uh, What Made the Golden Age Shine. Just go to booksale.greatdetectives.net to check that out. Well, now it's time for today's episode of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date is July the 13th, 1950. And the title is The Calgary Man. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Are you the insurance detective? That's right. Who's this? Johnny Doe, for now. Do you want to crack the Calgary job? What? Calgary Products down in Camden. 300,000 payroll robbery on the first of the month. This isn't my kind of a gag. Try it on somebody else, will you? Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is no gag. Check the Alliance Bonding Company in New York. They've kept it out of the papers. If you're interested, be at the same phone tomorrow night at 10. I'll call you. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you Edmund O'Brien in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Here's a taste treat you can enjoy indoors, outdoors, at work, or at play. The cool, long-lasting mint flavor refreshes you. The smooth, steady chewing helps keep you fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Alliance Bonding Company, New York City, New York. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Calgary matter. Expense account item one, $10.50 transportation from my Hartford apartment to Alliance's Manhattan office. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. I think Mr. Matthews is expecting me. The name is Dollar? Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. That door. Just go right in. Thank you. Yes. All right, Al. That'll be fine. The first bout starts at 8, but we don't care if we miss that. (laughs) All right. I'll see you then. Sorry, but you can't hurry a son, you know. That's all right. I'm Johnny Dollar, Mr. Matthews. Uh, Yes, yes. So I thought. Uh, Sit down, won't you? Uh Yes, sir. I don't want to be interrupted for the next hour, Miss Mills. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Dollar, do you put any stock in that telephone call? No, I haven't any idea. I don't know anything about it. I've done a lot of thinking since you phoned me about it, and of course there's nothing for us to do except to follow it up. But I can't help wondering if this man isn't a crank of some kind. Well, that's what I thought, too, until you bore him out by telling me there'd been a robbery that had been held from the press. Why has it been kept a secret? Well, all concerned thought it was the best idea, and 
there's a possibility that the group involved is the same one that carried off the brink robbery. But any publicity would only give away our hunch that the same gang pulled both jobs. What makes you think the Brink crowd might have pulled this one? Mm, because of the way it was executed. Simple perfection. The knowledge the criminals had of our operations. You see, one of our armored cars was to deliver a cash deposit to the Barton Bank in Camden to cover the Calgary Products payroll. The truck simply didn't arrive. It was found later, wrecked and empty. The driver and the guards? They were found three miles away, bound and gagged. Their descriptions matched those at Brink's, masks and so on. Yes, it was perfection. They knew exactly when and where. What do you want me to do? I've talked it over with the rest of the Alliance executives. We want you to follow that call through, but we must insist that you make every effort to maintain the security we have established. Here are the details. Expense account item two, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. At 9.45 that night, I was in my apartment waiting for the promised call from John Doe. At five past ten, my phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Stanley, three, four, six, nine. Yes? One moment, please. Philadelphia's calling. Philadelphia. You'll call to Hartford is ready. Go ahead, please. Mr. Dollar? Yeah? What did you decide about the Calgary job? Well, what happened to the man I talked with last night? He didn't dare phone you tonight. He was afraid you'd be set up with the police to trace the call. I haven't talked to the police. Don't. If you do, it's all off. He doesn't want to be arrested. He wants to surrender to the New Jersey District Attorney's men. The guy I talked with last night? No. He wasn't involved with Calgary. He was a friend of his. Do you want to talk it over with him? Where? There's a room reserved in the name of Charles Randall at the Branford Hotel in Bridgeport. Check into it between 7 and 8 tomorrow night. Sign the register, Charles Randall, 7458 Walnut Drive, Boston. Look, why doesn't he just take my address and come over here? He can't. Why not? Branford Hotel, Bridgeport. If you're interested, be there. Expense account item three, five dollars, mileage to Bridgeport and the Branford Hotel. It was a weathered frame building in the harbor district. I felt conspicuous walking across the lobby to the desk because I was the only man in sight who was wearing a tie. I wondered, since I was so out of place, why that address had been picked for a meeting that I assumed was not supposed to attract attention. My room was in the rear on the ground floor. I'd no more than opened the single window to air the room of the traces left by its previous tenant when I was signaled to the door. Dollar? Yeah. Let me come in. You got a driver's license or something? Better than that. A private operative's license. There you are. Thanks. I recognized your voice, but I thought I'd better make sure. Come on, we're going someplace else. Why? Because I'm not sure you weren't followed here. But I'll be sure we aren't going to be followed where we're going. I don't like it. It must be this way. You've got to believe me. He has to be careful. He doesn't want to get killed. Mm. What's the matter, the gang busting up? Come on. What started the trouble, splitting the loot? Dollar. Don't bother with me. I can't tell you anything because I don't know anything. Believe me, I'm only doing this to help him out. You don't have to come if you don't want to. Where do we go? You won't be coming back here. Don't leave anything but the keys to your car. Somebody will drive it out. Do you know where I parked it? It's the green coupe, isn't it? Yeah. He knows. Up through the lobby. There's a rear door. My car is parked just outside. We drove without speaking, crisscrossing town and backtracking until he was satisfied there were no followers. And then, out of town in roughly an easterly direction, following the shore of Long Island Sound. I clocked three and four tenth miles on the speedometer, starting at the city limits. Then he switched off the lights and turned right into a pair of ruts. Finally, we bounced to a stop in front of a cabin near the water. 
Watch your step. There are a couple of roots in the path. Did he come? He's here. Good. You wait in the car, will you? I don't think it'll take long. The first thing that impressed me as I walked past her into the single room was her youth. She didn't look much over 20. In spite of rather nondescript short brown hair and a band of freckles across an Irish nose, she was attractive. She was very small, and her violet eyes were very frightened. I'm glad you've come. Where's the man I've come after? He left. He decided at the last minute that it would be better if he didn't meet you tonight. Look, I've had enough. I don't play this way. I don't like to be made a fool of. But you aren't. Please be patient with us. I've been patient, and all I've gotten for it is some vague phone calls, pointless instructions, and a meeting in a crummy hotel that's right out of Dime Detective. I've had enough. Please help us. How can I help you when you don't give me anything? I don't know anything. And how can I help somebody who runs away? As far as I know, he doesn't even exist. I'll show you. Open it. His share of the Calgary money, Sid. Did you you take the wrapper, Jack? I can take this with me? Yes. Mm, Get it. Does it matter? He wants to give himself up. Why this way? I told you on the phone. He doesn't want to be arrested in this state. He wants to go directly to the district attorney's office in New Jersey where the robbery was committed. He'll turn state's witness? Yes. But he has a demand. Promise of immunity. It won't work. Any promise like that destroys the value of testimony. Might even bar it from the trial. It's been done. It's never promised. He'll have to take his chances on that. It doesn't have to be public. You can try, can't you? Sure, I can try it, but I won't get it. Anything else? Yes. He wants to be placed in protective custody until after the trial. How many other men were in on the job? He wouldn't tell me. I can't tell you anymore. Will you go to New Jersey? I'll have to have two days. I may not be able to see anybody tomorrow. All right. You'll call your Hartford number both nights at 10. You'll have to go now. Please do your best. Don't be ridiculous, Dollar. That's one of the most impertinent requests I've heard since I took office. Nothing personal, Mr. Kreider. I was asked to make it, and I did. Well... Would you see that he's placed under protective custody until after the trial? Why should I grant this criminal any favor? Well, if it means breaking the Calgary matter, it seems to me a favor or two would be worthwhile. We'll break it in due time. You know where he is? No, but I've been close. I may be able to bring him in if I can get you a word on a few of these things. Yeah, we'll see. Do you mind telling us where you've been operating? Now, you know I can't tell you that. These people are my clients now, more or less. I have to keep their confidences. Now... What's your answer? Answer? Definitely no immunity. Protective custody? Mm. All right. Yes, we'll assign a couple of men to guard him. Okay, Mr. Crino. I'll see what I can do with that. You'll hear from me in a day or so. Expense account items four and five, forty dollars travel from New Haven to Trenton, New Jersey, and from Trenton back to Hartford. I reached home too late for the phone call that first night, but it came the next, promptly at 10, from Boston this time. What happened, Dollar? How did you make out? No worse than I expected to. Protection, but no immunity. Oh, that's not so good. They weren't too happy with the situation. I think because they want to make an arrest themselves. Were you followed? Yeah, two men. They're watching my building now. I can lose them if you still want to negotiate. Can you come to Boston? Tonight? Yes, if you're sure you can shake the New Jersey men. Where do we meet? You're sure your line isn't tapped? They haven't had time, but they will if you don't quit stalling. Drive up through Springfield and Worcester. Just outside Boston, you'll pass through Auburndale. On the other side of it, there are two bridges. After you've crossed the second one, pull off the road and wait. All right, I'll be there. Well, let me tell you something. This is the last trip. Get your man off the dime. I can't spend the summer touring New England. I slipped out of Hartford, found the second bridge beyond Auburndale, pulled off the road, and sat there, listening to the night. I sat there for an hour before anything happened.
My name is Janet, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Are you the one? Yes. I'm the one. Get in. Thank you. Well, you caused quite a stir, Gannett. Yes, uh, so I understand. I've heard that crime pays only those who write about it and those who investigate. Are you armed? No, but satisfy yourself. The D.A. in Trenton? Uh, then, by all means, the D.A. and friends will be at the cottage by the sound. Right after you have delivered me. It wasn't a silent trip, but the subject of our scattered conversation was always far removed from the Calgary matter. Gannett's only typically criminal attitude was one of fear. He was never satisfied that we weren't being followed. We weren't. I learned that at 9.30 the next morning when we pulled up in front of the state building in Trenton. We hadn't been followed. They were waiting for him. Al. Al? No. No, don't. Don't. Al. Al. Someone in the crowd, it was impossible to know who, shot Gannett to death and disappeared in the confusion. It was sudden and unexpected. More unexpected, I think, than learning after police identification that Gannett, admitted criminal, was also Arnold Gannett, LLD. Professor of Law at Russell University, New Haven, Connecticut. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you keep going at your best. So for real chewing enjoyment that's refreshing and long-lasting, always keep Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. Healthful, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Gum will make every day more enjoyable. And now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. A lot of answers died with Professor Arnold Gannett on the sidewalk in front of New Jersey State Building, but one had been born at the same time. They answered why the police of six states had made no progress in the Calgary case. They'd been following usual procedures, carrying out their investigations in criminal circles. There was nothing for me in Trenton except the possibility of a session of questioning by the district attorney's men, so I faded out of sight and started back towards the cottage on Long Island Sound. Hello? Hi. Did it go all right? No, it didn't. It blew up. Somebody was waiting for us in Trenton. He killed Janet as he got out of the car. I thought we were careful enough. You were careful here and in Boston, but nobody was following you. They knew where he was going and waited for him. How did they find out? I don't know. He never told me anything about it. Where's the girl? She's asleep. She stayed awake all night. I don't know what this is going to do to her. She's his wife. She'll have to know. You're right. It'll be in the papers tomorrow, won't it? She was going back to New Haven in the morning. But I can't do it. I don't want to go in. I think you'd better. I don't know who you are, and so I don't want to lose track of you. Come on in with me. Very well. Mrs. Gannett? Mm-hmm. Mrs. Gannett? Oh, what is it? There's been trouble. Yes, there has. Where's Arnold? He's dead, Mrs. Gannett. No? Oh? He was killed before he could surrender. I, I want you to tell me who did it. I don't know. I don't know. 
I gave her an hour to get hold of herself. During that time, I learned that the other man at the cottage was Earl Becker of Bridgeport and a gardener at Arnold Gannett School. And closed, please find a copy of his statement. I had known Arnold Gannett since he was a student at Russell University. We got to be good friends when we started to fish the sound together. We didn't have anything else in common. But that sort of thing draws men together. I didn't know anything about the robbery until he told me he was in on it. That's all he told me. When he asked me to help him surrender, I said I would. When I returned to the cottage, Mrs. Gannett was dry eyed. Mr. Dollar, I appreciate what you've done. You tried to help us, and I know that you're not to blame for anything. Well, there's no way to stop it. It's all finished now. I want you to go back to Hartford. Oh, it's not as simple as that. I put myself out on a limb with the New Jersey district attorney. I won't get off it until this is cleared up. Are you telling me the truth when you say you don't know who your husband was teamed up with? I don't know. He wouldn't tell me. He said it was safer if I didn't know. What did he tell you? Nothing until after it was all over. Two weeks after. And I knew he was awake at night because something was troubling him. He couldn't lie to me. Your husband was a brilliant man, a doctor of letters. How did he get mixed up in this thing? On Tuesdays, he taught criminal psychology. Before the end of the semester, there was a lot of discussion on the Brink robbery in Boston. And he thought he had the best theory of all. That the men who robbed Brinks had never been criminals before? Yes. And were able to come back to their respectable lives and hide in them. Did he offer that theory to his classes? No. That's what started it. He couldn't get it out of his mind. He told you this? Not until afterwards. It grew into a challenge that he had to do something about. So he did it. And was successful. When he told me, I made him promise to give himself up. I made him do it. I'm sorry I have to keep after you, but there, there are things I have to know. These classes of his, how many students? It was a large enrollment this year. There were hundreds. Did your husband ever mention a man named Al? Oh, there were so many. I can't remember. Well, he must have kept records. Where can I find a list of his students? At our house in New Haven. Well, then we'll have to go there. I'll be outside. Please let me know as soon as you feel able to leave. By now, the time element had become important. I knew that before long, the police would be swarming into Gannett's house and make my search impossible. I also knew I'd be dragged back to New Jersey for questioning. On the way into town, I tried to get some more information from Mrs. Gannett, but no luck. She apparently knew nothing of her husband's actions. It was 6 p.m. when she opened the door of Professor Gannett's office. Across one wall stretched a row of file cabinets, his records and lists of students. I never knew how many men's names start with the letters A and L. In an hour, Becker and I gathered from the 1949 and 50 enrollments some hundred names from Allen to Alvin. There aren't any more here. What do you do with a list like this? They live all over the country. Here's one from Arizona, Nebraska, Florida. I don't think we'll have to bother with them. You're dropping it? No. I think I've found it. Which one? Hey, that car, check the window, will you? See if it's police. Yes, it is. Ah, I can't talk to them now. Show me the back way out of here, will you? This leads to the hall. Uh, what shall we tell them? Well, don't lie yourself into a trap. Tell them I just left. Uh, you don't know where I was going. Have you read the papers, Mr. Matthews? Professor Gannett? Yes, it's hard to believe. You knew him? Yes, I'd met him. I'm awfully sorry about this. But now you know how the robbery was carried off with such perfection, don't you? What do you mean? You mentioned it yourself. They knew exactly where the armored truck would be and when. 
Your son Albert was a student of Professor Gannett. What are you intimating? Well, there are thousands of students at Russell. I don't know of any other who has connections with a company that was robbed. I won't stand for it. The crime was committed because of a fixation Professor Gannett had about the Brink robbery. He felt he had to prove that respectable people could commit a crime and get away with it. He did it. But he couldn't have without knowing where your truck was going and approximately when it left New York. Where is your son? Strangely enough, this possibility had crossed my mind, too, but I, I just can't believe Where it. Where is he? He's in his room, packing for a canoe trip up in Vermont. Which one is his room? I'll show you. Come on, it's upstairs. Your suspicions are very strong, aren't they? Yes, they are, Mr. Matthews. What have you learned about my son? That his name is Albert. Then there, there is no proof. I don't know. I want to find out. But he would have no reason to do anything like this. I have always given him everything he wanted. He... But he's a brilliant boy, much too intelligent. Here's his room. Al? Yes, Dad? What is it? May we come in? Well, I was just finishing... Oh, I'm sorry. Al, uh, this is Mr. Dollar. I'm the investigator working on the Calgary matter. Oh? Well, uh, excuse the room. My stuff's all over the place. I'm going up north. Where were you this morning at 9 o'clock? Why, I... What is this? Where were you? I don't see that it makes any difference. It does. Because I was with Professor Arnold Gannett at 9 o'clock. Before he was killed, he called to somebody named Al. What does he mean, Dad? I don't understand. Mind if I look over your room? For what? For a gun. A thirty-eight, from the sound of it. The police will be able to check the slugs that killed Gannett. <laughs> Dad. Yes, Albert? Dad, I... I did it. I don't know why. I, I don't... What will I do? I don't know. Dad, it, it wasn't supposed to end like this. Dad. I... I can't help you now, son. All right. All right, then I'll get away. I'll... No, you don't. It's no use. Get away. Get away Ow. from me. Get... Oh. I'm sorry, Mr. Matthews. Yes, Mr. Dollar. I'm sorry, too. Albert Matthews' statement, by the time he had finished, involved two other law students. They, too, were from families that should have not included criminals. And I wonder if Professor Gannett's unsuccessful experiment doesn't mean that the Brink robbery, $2 million wasn't committed by persons now hiding behind respectable lives. Expense account total, $1,180. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, to make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. There's lots of cooling, real mint flavor in every stick. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, wherever you go, keep some healthful, refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role, and is written by Gil Dowd and David Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Leif Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen starring in the Columbia Pictures production, 7-Eleven Ocean Drive. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted Osborne, Florence Lake, Bill Boucher, Virginia Gregg, John Daner, and Terry Kilburn. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum 
Hope you've enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum every day. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns in another adventure of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Uh, when I was listening to the episode, I was thinking at first that I was going to have to figure out what pronunciation to give it because they it spelled Calgary, but they had you know another pronunciation at the start. But then somebody in the middle of it uh, pronounced it Calgary. It seemed like the actors were not exactly together on how this word was pronounced. So I'm okay saying the Calgary matter. I, I, I feel comfortable with that. One big question I have in sort of this pre-Jack Johnstone uh, world, you know, of course, when Jack Johnstone uh, was running the series, uh, it was kind of an in-universe fact that Johnny had his own radio program, uh, and his adventures were broadcast on the radio. Uh, but this is not, you know, 1950, that's not uh, a thing. So how did these people know that Johnny was an insurance investigator? So that's a little bit of a hole in that. But other than that, this was uh, an interesting case. It did play on a pretty popular idea in fiction about uh, professors uh, becoming uh, criminals, which may have got, been something that goes back to... Uh, Professor Moriarty, but they but they went to the idea of these sort of non-criminal professors planning these uh, heists. All right, well, some listener comments and feedback now regarding the Barbara James matter. Uh, Bill writes, "Hi, Adam. I really like this episode, and not just for the story, but the talent used. A nice Mayberry connection with Howard McNear and Parley Bear, and of course the fabulous Stacy Harris. Thanks. Well." Thank you so much, Bill. Appreciate your commenting. I also want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you so much to Mick. Mick's been one of our Patreon supporters since June of 2015, currently supporting us at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Mick. And that will actually do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Dragnet. Next Friday, another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.